Good morning. I want to express appreciation to the Leafs of Faith for that great presentation this morning. Uh, they have a program coming up next weekend. I hope you'll check out the details about that. I think it's uh, is it next Sunday? Saturday. Saturday. Tell me the time. Five? Five o'clock. And so we invite you to come here and uh, be a part of their great ministry and uh, be blessed by their presentation. Well, I know you're surprised to see me up here this morning. If you're uh, visiting and expected to see our senior pastor, uh, he has the flu. And so uh, please pray for Pastor Dean. Uh, I learned about this about five o'clock yesterday, so good luck with you this morning. <laughs> uh, this is Memorial Weekend. And uh, someone said it's not a holiday, uh, it's a special day. Uh, Memorial Weekend, we remember our departed loved ones. Uh, uh, it's just a special time as we remember, uh, as we reflect upon the many memories that we have of uh, those that we have loved and lost. But we especially, I think, are grateful for those who defend our country on a continual basis. And uh, thank you. And even though we do this on, on uh, Veterans Day, I want to do it again this morning. If you're here and you have loved ones that have served or are serving in the armed services, any branch, or if uh, you uh, are a veteran and have served, uh, I want you to stand. Would you please stand? We have a lot of people here. <laughs> remain standing. <clears throat> please remain standing. And I want to include, I forgot to include, first responders. If you're here this morning and you are on the team of any first responding team in our community, you're included in this. Would you stand? Anyone here? But we have firefighters, and we have policemen, we have sheriffs, we have all kinds of people locally. And then, of course, we have all the branches in our country, the armed services, who have served and have loved ones who are serving. And as you remain standing, I would like to pray. Let's pray together. God, our Father in heaven, <clears throat> on this memorial weekend, we give you thanks and praise for those, our Father, that uh, we know who are uh, out there even now defending our freedom, defending our country. Lord, every, everybody in here this morning, as we come to worship you, on this Memorial Weekend remembers loved ones who are no longer with us. They have lived their life and they have gone on uh, to be with you. And we want to just thank you for them too, because the memories that we have of our loved ones is just really important to us. And we thank you for the impact that they have made on our lives. And we're thankful that we can take this weekend, especially tomorrow, and remember them and celebrate the lives that they lived. But also, our Father, to celebrate the freedom that we have in this country and those who have not only served by giving their time and sacrificed in many ways, but those who have sacrificed the ultimate sacrifice in giving their lives in defense of our freedom. We thank you, God, and we praise you. And I pray that we would express our gratitude to all of those folks in a special way on a continual basis, because God, we, with all of the challenges that we have in this country, we still are free and we're thankful and we give you praise and glory and honor this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and thank you. <clears throat> Back in the book of Joshua, and if you want to turn to Joshua 4, you can do that. <clears throat> But back in the Old Testament book of Joshua, the nation of Israel stood on the banks of the Jordan River, and they were coming out of the wilderness wanderings. They had left Egypt. God had been so faithful to them. And we all know the story. 
Not only about the time that they spent in Egypt, but they also spent 40 years wandering in the desert. And they spent that long wandering because, basically, of their lack of faith. And I don't know about you, but I think from time to time I've wandered in my life because I've had a lack of faith. I just haven't trusted God to the extent that I should have. But anyway, after their wandering, a new generation had been raised up, and they're about now to cross the Jordan River into the promised land. When they got to the Jordan River to prepare to come out of the desert and entered what God had promised them, the Jordan River was swollen. It was flooded. And some probably were standing on the banks of the Jordan wondering, why would God have such terrible timing to allow the Jordan to be flooded and overrunning its banks? But like always, God had a plan. And so he parted the waters of the Jordan River, just like he did at the Red Sea. And the hundreds, probably hundreds of thousands of the Israelites crossed the Jordan River on dry land. God had a plan he provided miraculously, and they were able, without even getting mud on their shoes, their sandals, enter the promised land. Then 12 men were chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel, and each man was instructed to take a large rock from the middle of the dried up Jordan River riverbed and set those 12 stones up as a pillar and a sign for future generations to remember the provision of God. And this is what we read in Joshua 4, 4 through 7. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you in the future when you, your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel. You see, the Lord wanted the people to have a monument that would be a sign to future generations about what had occurred on this day, this special day. According to Webster, a memorial is that which serves to perpetuate the memory of something or someone. We have, on this memorial weekend, an opportunity to perpetuate the memory of a lot of people and maybe even some events, certainly some events. All of the conflicts that this country has survived in order to preserve its freedom and enjoy the opportunities that we have every day, we are blessed beyond measure. And so this Memorial Day is a time to remember, a time to reflect upon the memory of loved ones who are no longer with us, a time to honor those who have served our country by sacrificing, and some, the ultimate sacrifice of giving their lives. This observance goes all the way back, if you don't know, to the Civil War. It was observed by the northern states as a special day to honor soldiers who were killed in action. The commander of the Army, John Logan, issued an order designated May the 30th, 1868, for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in the defense of this country. Chief Logan went on to say, we do this with the hope that it would be kept year after year after year, and thus it has, and we celebrate Memorial Day. 
Now, I understand that it has changed a little bit through the years. We've included those that perhaps Commander Logan didn't have in mind, but nonetheless, it's a special day set aside nationally for the observance of remembering what we need to remember. Special people in our lives that have touched us. I know I have many, many fond memories of my parents who have been gone now for many years, but still this day, I remember them. Not only on Memorial Day, but I remember them almost every day. There's rarely a day that goes by that I don't think about the heritage that my parents passed along to me. And not just the way that they raised me, but the way that they took care of me, not only physically, but spiritually. Because we were in church. We were in faith. I was raised in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've, I give my parents the credit for that. Who knows where I would be today if it were not for that kind of upbringing. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you have the same testimony. Where would you be if it were not for a mom and dad who really loved you and not just provided for you physically, but they provided for you spiritually by making sure that the Lord Jesus Christ was a big part of your life. And I have that testimony and I'm thankful to stand here this morning and thank God for blessing me with parents. You think it'll rain? And so, uh, Memorial Day is a special day. We honor America and those who live to contribute to the history of this country, all of our loved ones. Now, as important as this is, to perpetuate the memory of our loved ones, today is the Lord's Day. And most of you Make your way to this place every Sunday because this is what the early church did. They came together. They didn't have a lovely facility like this, but they came together. They met together, and the book of Acts chapter 2 says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. And all those things we try to make a part of this service every Sunday when we come here. And the breaking of bread is the Lord's Supper. And you know, for we who are believers, we know how important it is to observe the important memorial of the Lord's Supper because of not only what it represents, but who it represents. And so the message from this point on this morning is really going to be a long communion meditation. And a little bit later in this service, as we always do, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. And many of us are here because we believe that to be as great as the worship is. And I'm so thankful for our worship team that leads us wonderfully in worship every Sunday. As great as the sermons are on Sunday, Pastor Dean does an incredible job of sharing God's Word with us Sunday after Sunday. In spite of all of that, our service is a crescendo that leads us to the high point of remembering Jesus Christ as our Savior. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we hold the little wafer, the bread representing his broken body, and we hold the cup that represents his shed blood, and we remember Jesus. So I want to read to you, you thought Joshua was, was our text, but our text is really 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29. And this is what it says. This is the Apostle Paul recounting Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. And often we recite these verses as we partake of the Lord's Supper, and fittingly so, we should. But this is what it says. The Apostle Paul speaks these words to the church at Corinth, and he says, For I have received from the Lord that which I pass on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There's a lot of key words, and we're going to look at some of them this morning in these few verses. But the one that really stands out on this Memorial Weekend is the word remembrance. I'm not a person that looks back. I don't know how you are, but I know a lot of people, they just, they like to live in the past. I don't like to live in the past. And some people, they live in the future. And there can be good and bad about both, okay? We can look too far in the past and it can become a real weight, especially if the past is full of bad things. And that can be a burden. And I think that's a tool the enemy uses in the lives of a lot of people to rob them of their joy. They live in the past. They live in their regrets and the mistakes of the past. That's not good. And some people have their head in the clouds and all they think about is what is ahead that will probably never happen or never come about. So we need to strike a happy balance here in looking back and remembering and also looking ahead and trusting God for our future. And Memorial, Memorial Day is one of those good times when we can look back and celebrate the lives of loved ones. And Sunday when we come here and when we worship the Lord and when we hear his word and when we meet him at communion time it's a time to remember and look back to calvary and see what happened on that day that changed the history it changed the calendar it changed everything for people of faith because we know that it took us out of an old life of death into a new life of living an old life of no promise to a new life with every promise and that's why we meet here we meet here to celebrate the promise that Jesus gave us on Calvary. And so Paul reminds the Corinthian church, and I'm reminding you today, of these important words as Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, so that later in the service today, we will once again be reminded of what Jesus has done for us. And I hope and pray that this never becomes rote routine, I hope it never becomes just a habit. I hope that every time we meet Jesus at the Lord's Supper, that is fresh, it's new, it's exciting, and we're grateful. And we're going to talk about this this morning. And so, according to the Apostle Paul, this memorial, the Lord's Supper, must involve several thoughts as we partake. And you can write these down. Five things I want you to see, different things that we need to look at as we partake of the Lord's Supper. And you might not remember all of these all of the time, but maybe this will remind you of some of the things that we need to do as we partake of the Lord's Supper. First of all, we need to look up. We have an upward look, and that's to God. Verse 24 of our text from 1 Corinthians 11 says, when he had given thanks, Jesus in instituting the Lord's Supper looked up. He looked up to his father and he gave thanks. Now here is Jesus facing the cross and he's still giving thanks to his father in heaven for the mission that he came to this earth to accomplish, and that is to sacrifice his life on Calvary's cross so that you and I might be set free from sin and live in these promises that we enjoy every day. So as we approach the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day, we need to approach the Lord's Supper with thanksgiving. We ought to give thanks to God for releasing his son who was with him in glory to come to the sin-infested world and to provide a plan, a way whereby we could be saved, we could be rescued, we could be redeemed, we could be delivered from the shackles of sin and be taken off the broad road that leads to death onto the narrow road that leads to life eternal and we live in the hope and the promise of heaven. And so we look up 
Again, the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. You know, that ought to be our daily motto. We live in a land where so many people are so ungrateful. I've had opportunity, and I consider it a blessing, to have traveled to different distant places in this wonderful world that God created. I've been to the Holy Land. I've been to the, some of the places that we read about in Scripture every time we read. I've been to Athens and Corinth. I've been to Rome. I've been to the Holy Land, to the Israel. I've been to the empty tomb, Jerusalem, Galilee, took a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee. Some of you have had that experience. I've been to the Caribbean, to some of the nations down there, uh, to uh, the Dominican Republic. And as you travel around and you go from place to place outside of this country, you come back and you feel like kneeling down and kissing the ground because there's no place quite like this place. I, don't, I believe that's true. I don't, th I don't think you can go to another place on this globe and be as blessed as we are. And so why should we not be thankful? Even in the midst of whatever you may be facing this morning. And so Jesus gave thanks as he instituted the Lord's Supper. As we partake of it, please remember to look up to God and give thanks. Matthew Henry, a famous scholar and Bible commentator, once was attacked and he was robbed. And that night he wrote these words in his diary. I think this is incredible. He said, Lord, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, Lord, because although they took my money, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took all that I had, it was not all that much. <laughs> And fourth, because it was me who was robbed and not me who did the robbing. You see, in all circumstances, we can give thanks. Secondly, not just the upward look, but the backward look. And when we look back, I'm not talking about looking back on your mistakes, looking back on your failures, looking back on bad memories. I hope that your backward look is full of full memories or fond memories. And I hope that you'll forget the bad and remember the good. But when we talk about a backward look this morning, we're looking back to Calvary. We're looking back to Jesus. And in communion, we are focusing upon him. That's a key word to focus because we are distracted by so many things when we come to the Lord's house and especially when we come to communion. It's a quiet time usually, it's a, it's a meditative time, it's a sacred time, and we need to focus, and we need to focus on the body and the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us. There's a story told about a general in the army of Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he came home from battle, he came home from war and discovered that his wife had been arrested for treason. The general rushed to the king's court, saw his wife, who had been terribly mistreated, and he attempted to defend his wife to the court and answer the charges against her, but he had no success in doing that. And back then, they did things very swiftly. And so at the trial, which happened very soon, he heard the stern voice of the Persian ruler pronounce the death of sentence, uh, the sentence of death upon his wife. And as the guards took her away for immediate execution, the general fell on his knees before the king and he said, not her, master, but me. Put me to death, but please spare my wife. And Cyrus was so moved as he looked into the face of the general and was so touched by his love and devotion for his wife, and Cyrus was so moved by this general's bravery that he offered his wife a complete pardon. But here's the important part. As the general 
led his wife away from the court that day, he said to her, did you see the compassion in the eyes of the emperor as he pronounced the words of pardon? And his wife said to him, the only face I could see was the face of a man who was willing to die for me. And that's what communion ought to be. The only face we ought to be able to see when we come to communion time is the face of the man who was willing to die for me. We should scrub away all of the distractions. We could focus upon Jesus and get the reality of what he did for each of us. Thirdly, we have the outward look. Now, I'm not going to spend very much time here because George Murray last week, for you, those of you that were here, did an outstanding job of telling us about how important it is that we get the gospel to the world. But verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 11 says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Did you ever think about the fact that every Sunday when you gather here and you partake of the Lord's Supper, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again? You are a witness to the world that you believe that there is a God in heaven who sent his son to this earth, who sacrificed himself on Calvary for you and me and for our salvation. That's a proclamation the world needs to hear. And as people drive by here this morning and see how many ever cars there are here out here in their parking lot, whether they are people of faith or not, they know that something special for the believer is happening inside. It's a proclamation to our community and even to the world, according to Jesus, that this is something special and ought to be faithfully observed. Jesus died not just for us, but he died for everyone. He died for whosoever will may come. And so there is that outward look to the world, and we should always keep that in mind as we come to communion time. Fourthly, there is the forward look, and this is the happy message. The forward look for all of us is heaven. Heaven. The last three words of verse 26 said, says, until he comes, until he comes. Observe the Lord's Supper until he comes, and I believe that he will celebrate with us in glory the remembrance of him. It'll be a great banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb. We must remember that we have a promise. And that this world is not our home, we're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon us from heaven's open door. Someday we'll not feel at home in this world anymore, and I hope that's true today. We're just pilgrims, aliens, passing through. We shouldn't be planning to stay here. In two weeks, I'll be 72 years old. I want you to know I don't plan to stay here. <laughs> and that's becoming evident more and more every day as this body begins to grow old and weak, frail, whatever. And that's true of everybody. We're either going to go or he's going to come one way. We're going to meet him. We're going to stand before him face to face. And I want us to be able to stand before him or kneel before him because that's what we want to do. And I want us to be able to say, Jesus, I remembered you in my life. And that's the only thing that's going to matter. If your life was full of this world and not Jesus, it's not going to be good. But if your life was full of Jesus and less of this world, he will say to you and he'll say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will now make you ruler over many things. Enter in now to the joy of your Lord. That's the look forward to heaven. We have a limited time here. Let's make the very best of it. 
because he's coming back, and it could be any time. Finally, we have the inward look, and this is a very, very important look, and I think this is one most of us understand when we come to communion time. It's so important for us to do a self-examination. If you read further in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat of the bread and drink of the cup, not discerning the body and the blood of Christ, judgment will come upon them. You see, true worship, and that's why I like the order of our service so often, true worship leads to self-examination. Self-examination leads to confession, understanding that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And confession leads to repentance. And so it's so important that we take an inward look every time we come to the Lord's Supper. When Leonardo da Vinci painted his famous picture of the Lord's Supper, and we're all familiar with it, we've all seen it, he asked a friend of his what most impressed him about the picture. And his friend responded and said, I believe it is, it is that cup in the hand of Jesus. It catches my eye immediately when I look at this picture. And then da Vinci, with one stroke of the brush, wiped the cup away. And he said, nothing must distract us from the face of Jesus. And so it is in the Lord's Supper. Nothing in our lives should ever distract us from the face of Jesus. Yet if we're not careful, not just at communion time, but in, in the course of life in general, if we're not careful, we can be so caught up and so distracted by the things of this world that Jesus takes a second seat, a back seat, and that is not where he would have us live. He wants us on the front seat. He wants our attention. He wants our devotion. We love him because he first loved us. A little boy who lived with his family in the area of our country at Tall Mountains came to his mother one day and said, Mom, there's a boy out there in the woods and he's making fun of me. Every time I say, everything I say, he repeats. If I say hello, he says hello. If I say, who are you, he says, who are you? Finally, I got mad. I went to the, over the fence, and I couldn't find anybody. And I said, I'll knock you out. And the voice came back, I'll knock you out. And then the mother told the boy, son, you're hearing your own echo. If you would have said, I love you, the voice would have come back, I love you. And so as we remember Jesus, and as we come to the foot of the cross, Jesus says, I love you. He wants us to know that more than anything else. And he wants us to echo that to the people that we come in contact with each and every day. Remember, this Memorial Weekend, remember your loved ones, remember those who have defended our freedom, and give thanks. But let's also, not only on Sunday, but every day, let's remember. Let's remember Jesus. And let's use these different views that we've looked at this morning to enhance our memory of him and what he's done for us. And I hope this, this will help us keep our eyes upon him, Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let's pray, please. God, our Father, thank you for this time together, and thank you for this look into your word, and thank you, our Father, that we have a memorial. Just like the Israelites established a memorial with 12 rocks, 
to remind them of your provision, remind them uh, of the, your deliverance, of your many promises. God, we have a memorial, and it's the Lord's Supper, and we thank you for this opportunity to remember Jesus. And just a little later in this service, God, when we remember him, help us, our Father, to focus and help us to take a hard, long look at all that you have done for us as we look back, as we look forward, as we look all around us. Help us to love you more and more as we remember Jesus day after day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and stand. We remember where we are right now in this place. Ready for God to lead us in his very presence together.
talked a lot about what is about to happen here this morning. But I want to pass on just another little important factor. You know, Jesus didn't leave us alone. When he left, he sent us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us, empowers us to live the life that God has called us to live so that we would have the desire, so that we would have the ability to focus on Jesus, to live for him, to walk with him. We can't do it on our own. And so this morning, thank God for his Holy Spirit that enables us to be true disciples, true followers, and draw upon that power every day and right now as we partake to remember Jesus, his broken body, his shed blood. Examine your life. Make a pledge to God today that what you've done that don't please him, you're going to allow his power to transform you and make you more of what he would have you to be. Rejoice as you look forward to heaven because that promise is yours and it's because of what we're about to remember. It's Jesus. Look into his face and celebrate his love. Hold the emblems until everybody's been served and then we'll partake together.
as Jesus was there sharing the Passover meal with his disciples, I can't help but think about how uh, it was probably much like this. Uh, when we think about what God has done for us, I mean, it's like this family of God that's meeting in a place together. And I look up at some of you during that time, even just now, and I see your faces and uh, just how happy you are to know what God has done for us and to remember that. And that's what we do right now. So let's remember that together. When Jesus was there to, with his disciples in the upper room, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them and told them, this bread is my body that's broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he passed it out to them and told them, this cup is my blood that's shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and we drink of this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. This morning, we have a baptism, which I'm really excited about. Scott uh, has been able to um, uh, have some time with a student. Uh, I saw him this week uh, in, the, in his office just talking through some things. So let's all uh, just be here together to witness it. Well, good morning, everybody. This is, this is Brianna West. Uh, she is here uh, to get baptized today. She's uh, 17 and goes to Fairfield Union. I met with her this week, and it was just absolutely incredible to hear her story. Um, God has really been working in her life, and, um, you know, we're in the middle of a, a Jonah series, as Dean's been teaching, and God gets your attention in different ways, and she said over the last year, she's gone through two different knee surgeries. See, Brianna's a soccer player, um, and God's gotten her attention, and it's just reminding her of the importance of keeping him in the right place, and so we're excited. Mom and Dad are here, um, and so they're, they're back at Fairfield uh, Christian, and they've been here the last few weeks, and we're excited to do... Uh, baptism for Brianna today. Brianna, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Yes. I'm going to ask you just to repeat the good confession if you would. Say, I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, the Son of the Living God, and I have accepted Him, and I have accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Well, you're now my sister, so I get to baptize you in the name of the Father, mm -hmm. and the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of His death raised to walk in newness of life. I mean, that never gets old. It never gets old. I love it. I love it. Well, we uh, have another opportunity to show you guys a little bit more what goes on during the week and then also uh, what we have coming up for our Kids Quest ministry with Spring Hill. So why don't you go ahead and check this video out. Register your child for Spring Hill. Hop online at fairfieldchristian.org and click on children. We hope that your kids will join us for Spring Hill. I'm almost embarrassed to get up after that. Well, as you can see, Spring Hill is upon us just a couple of weeks away, and we need your help. 
And so uh, we uh, right now only have four host homes and we need at least seven. And so if you're able to host some of the Spring Hill people that will be helping put this on, uh, please stop at the Kids Quest desk and talk to them out there because we need to pull together some extra help uh, before the week actually begins. Uh, we also need some what they call counselors in training. I think that's what that stands for, uh, CITs. And uh, so uh, if you're able to, uh, maybe you're a young person and you've got this time that you can help with this uh, day camp, uh, please encourage your young person to come and uh, become a CIT for that week. There's a lot of different things they can do to help with Spring Hill, and we need quite a few more of those uh, also. So uh, let's pull together, uh, let's get behind uh, Spring Hill Day Camp, and let's really uh, uh, make this a great event uh, for the 120 plus kids that'll be here. The other thing I want to mention is our Kids Quest ministry is recruiting during the month of May and uh, all May long. Uh, they want to plan for the summer, for the coming fall. And uh, if you're excited about what Randy and her team are doing here, and I know I am, uh, you really need to think about how you can participate in the Kids Quest ministry. So once again, there's a lot of different places where you can be used, a lot of different ways you can be used. If you want to volunteer, stop at the desk, the Kids Quest desk out there, and they will be glad to help you with that. Any other announcements? That's it. Okay. Ordination, right? Okay, we get into our ordination time then, uh, right now. I'm happy to announce to you, if you were here last week, you know we had a very brief congregational meeting after both services, and the purpose of that meeting was to uh, affirm a slate of officers, elders and deacons, uh, for the coming term, which is three years. And so uh, uh, I'm happy to say that by a large majority, all of our candidates were approved. And so this morning, uh, we want to set them apart through an ordination ceremony. And you're going to be a part of that because leadership in the church is everything. And we've got great leaders here. And the new group that's coming on are also going to contribute to that great team that we already have in place. So at this time, I'd like to invite the elders, all of the elders that are here this morning in service, if you'd come forward to the platform. And uh, Charlie Black is our new elder. Uh, Dave Phelan was also affirmed, but Dave was called out of town. And so he couldn't be here for the ordination this morning. Uh, but we are very thankful for uh, Charlie and Dave uh, stepping forward uh, to become the new elders uh, for the coming uh, three years, the three-year term. And so we've got some slides, I hope, for the uh, big screen. And uh, we would like to ask Charlie to step forward because he's the man of the hour. And uh, this is what we want to, uh, we can just turn and look at the slides on the screen. Do you, uh, Charlie, in the presence of God in this congregation, uh, to be dedicated, uh, to be a, a dedicated uh, shepherd of the church, uh, do you promise to honor and uphold the name and the cause of Jesus Christ in your home, on the job, in the community, and in his church. With God's help, I will. And do uh, you men, or do, do you solemnly promise to fulfill in discharging the duties and responsibilities of the eldership to the best of your ability and to do so in the spirit of love? With God's help, I will. God bless you. Now, to the congregation, do you as a church family pledge to support and uphold uh, Charlie and Dave uh, as elders of the Church of Jesus Christ in the coming years. And your response is on the screen. Thank you very much. And now, Charlie, if you'll kneel uh, before the congregation and... Yes, you do. Phil Peters, chairman of our elders currently, is going to have the prayer of ordination. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask for a fuller measure of your spirit to be upon Charlie and Dave, a spirit of leadership, a mantle of leadership placed upon them, that their hearts would listen to you even more 
and that they would join in the other, with the other elders in unity. God, we ask for a blessing upon the elders to work as a team together in unity to lead this church, to take this church where you want it to go. Father, we rely totally on you and not on the wisdom of men, but on the wisdom that comes from you, God, and your spirit. And we ask for that wisdom and that mantle of leadership to be upon Charlie and Dave. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you, brother. And now at this time, if we could have the new deacon candidates, they're no longer candidates, they are deacons, and they're going to be ordained at this time. So men, if you come to the platform, those who could be here, I know there may have been, we, uh, we affirmed 11 new uh, deacons for the coming three-year term. And I'm certainly grateful to all of these men for their willingness to serve in this capacity. And so uh, we'll have a very similar uh, reading. Uh, from the big screen here this morning concerning our deacons. And so, men, if you'll face the screen. As deacons, do you men promise in the presence of God in this congregation to serve faithfully as deacons? Will you honor and uphold the name of the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ in your home, on the job, in the community, and in his church? Do you solemnly promise to be faithful in discharging the duties and responsibilities of the deaconship to the best of your ability, and do you do so in the spirit of love? With God's help, we will. And now, uh, to you as a congregation, uh, do you, as our church family, promise to support and uphold these men in the service of the Lord as deacons within the church? Very good. Men, if you'll kneel before the church family here, and our elders will ordain you by the laying on of hands. And I believe Dave Crum, who is our assistant chairman of the current eldership, will lead us in the prayer of ordination. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for all your many blessings. Thank you for this church and our congregation. We thank you so much for these men that have been called to be deacons. Just ask you to be with them, guide them, and give them wisdom to do all the things that you have called them to do. Just ask that you would protect uh, their families and all those around them as well, and let them be a light to this church and community. And just thank you for them and ask you for a blessing upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you guys. You all can be seated. God bless you. Okay. All right. Just one last thing here this morning. I'd like to call, uh, you need to say, Phil, Megan, and then uh, Dave and Michelle. These are the two elders that are ruling off this year, and uh, we want to express our deepest appreciation to them. For those of you who have been here at Fairfield for any length of time at all, you know that these two couples have been uh, great examples, great servants in the life of the church for many years. Uh, Dave uh, and Phil have served so faithfully uh, uh, as elders in the church, and it's just uh, been a great three years. I know uh, uh, we're going to miss you men, and uh, as the old saying goes, behind every good man is a, a greater woman, something like that. <laughs> And so we want to thank uh, you ladies for standing behind your man and uh, encouraging him and fulfilling his responsibilities. And so uh, we've got uh, some appreciation here, and uh, we want to thank you so very, very much for your years of service and your faithfulness to the church and, uh, of course, your friendship. It's meant a lot to all of us. Thank you very much. Would you give them a hand? At this time, we're going to close. Let's stand. It's been a great day in the Lord. Amen. Let's go ahead and close with this song.
Almighty God.